Yes, I'm recording. Okay. Um, startup financing strategies. I am going to go ahead and share my screen. And what you should see now are my slides. This is startup financing strategies. And we're going to cover a variety of topics in terms of how to get your startup uh, financed. Uh, first of all, this is not legal advice, even though I'm a lawyer. This is more like my opinion. It's not specific to your situation. Uh, if you want legal advice, we need to drill down into your particular facts. So basic principles um, that I'd like you to keep in mind as we go through, we're going to go through today like a number of different ways that startup companies access capital and raise money. And that's most of what I do all day every day is I work with companies that are, I form companies, I do financings, some commercial contracts, and then M&A. And a big part of that, of course, is the financing component. So some basic principles to keep in mind um, as we talk about all of these different various ways to get money or the ones that they apply to. Number one, just keep in mind that taking on an investor is a really big decision. All right, that's a, that's a big deal. That's not something that you should do lightly. Um, <clears throat> The investors are your partners. Um, and what I mean by that is that once you take an investor, it's very difficult to decide you don't like them. You can't just give them their money back. You can't just ask them to leave. You're pretty much stuck with them for the duration. It's like a marriage without a divorce. So just be really careful. Uh, now, sometimes investors get bought out. Sometimes they, they want to leave. Um, but usually if, if you're at that stage, it's going to be a very painful process. So number one, do your diligence on your investors. And I'll talk more about that later. Number two, stage your financing. A lot of companies come to me and they say, uh, we've got a really great thing here and we want to go out and raise $10 million, even though we've not raised a dime from anybody yet. Well, number one, that's a really hard thing to do. It's really, really difficult because you have to go to the institutions for that kind of money. And they're gonna to wanna to see traction. They're gonna to wanna to see product market fit. They're gonna wanna see that you're capable of scaling. So it's really hard to go from zero to a venture financing immediately. Secondly, even if you could, you wouldn't want to. And the reason why uh, is because if you give away, if you raise that much money early on in your company's life, you're giving away too much of your company's equity. So we like to stage finances. We do it in smaller tranches. So just keep that in mind. You always only want to take as much money as you need and not more than that because that's going to be overly dilutive, which brings me to my third point. Funding is going to be dilutive. Um, now, there are some, some types of funding that are not. There's government grants. There's revenue, the best funding ever. Uh, there's crowdfunding, uh, rewards-based crowdfunding. That's not dilutive. But everything else is going to be dilutive. Some token issuances might not be dilutive, but most of the funding you're going to go after is going to be dilutive. You just have to accept that, you know, and learn to live with that because your investor is taking huge risk and they need the potential for huge re returns. The flip side of that is that uh, selling equity is really expensive, right? That is very expensive money because you're giving up equity, which is going to be worth a lot more in the future than what you're getting now. If you could do it through debt, you would absolutely 100% of the time take debt every time because it is so much cheaper. Um, fourth thing, you know, founders get so hung up on valuation and sometimes they get competitive, sometimes they take it personally, but valuation has a lot less to do with what your company's worth than what it has to do with really two other factors. One, how much equity your investor needs uh, in your company for them to justify the investment, uh, and two, how much money you need to get to the next valuation metric. If you have those two variables, poof, you solve for the third one, your valuation. And it might have very little to do with what the company is worth today. Just keep that in mind, valuation, I feel like is a plug number, uh, not a place you start from. It's also not your biggest issue because you're gonna be resetting that valuation so many times in your company's life um, that uh, today's valuation only means how you're dividing up today's pie. And more importantly, there are other terms of an investment that can really 
really hurts you a lot more than a low valuation. We'll talk more about that. Uh, avoid early mistakes. That's why you're here to learn you know, what to do right, what not to do wrong. Uh, you take cheap money over expensive money. That sounds obvious, but that means if you can take debt, you take debt. You know? um, common stock is for service providers. What we're talking about here today is primarily <clears throat> selling preferred stock to investors. Common stock, you want to have priced cheap. Preferred stock for investors, you want to have priced quite high. Right? You get the most bang for your buck that way. So uh, keep the common stock for the service providers. You don't sell common to raise money. And then a couple practical things. Get a data room <laughs> early in your life. Just make your life so much easier. And along with that, just do all your corporate cleanup. Whatever has to be fixed, do that ahead of time. You don't want investors telling you there's something wrong with your company. That's going to hurt. All right. Some of the sources of funding that I'll try to talk a little bit about, uh, first of all, founder money, of course, founders tend to put a little money in, uh, enough to have skin in the game, not so much that they might do something crazy. Debt financing, if you can get it, government grants, friends and family, angel seed investors, incubators, venture capital and institutions, and then we'll talk a little bit about alternative financing vehicles that are out there that are getting to be less and less alternative every day. So most startups are going to rely on some founder money, um, some personal savings. And like I say, uh, there's nothing wrong with that, using a little bit of your own money. But just keep in mind, and I've heard investors say this, I want to make sure they have some of their own skin in the game, but not so much that they might do something crazy to save this money, like lie to me. So just keep that in mind. Um, now, uh, one thing I would caution you is what I caution against, and this is contrary to what you're gonna hear from a lot of other people. And that's because I'm a lawyer and I see a lot of companies and I see how many fail and I see how many succeed. Um, if I were you, I would not mortgage your house to fund your startup. If I were you, I would not raid your 401k to fund your startup, right? If I were you, I would set that aside and make that just completely sacrosanct and just not touch it at all. So that's just my personal rule. And I've heard people counsel founders, oh, go mortgage your house to finance this idea. Ideally, you want just enough money from you to get your idea launched. You want to use somebody else's money, somebody who is much more experienced and more capable of taking risk um, to, to finance the rest of it. Um, and, and keep in mind, you know, there's a reason for that, because if your first idea fails, I want you to be around to fight another day and come back with the next idea. How much should you take? How much do you take? Well, here's some averages. Uh, angels will generally, these numbers are a little old. I think angels put in more than this now, but we'll say 25 and up. Uh, you can probably get from each individual angel. Angel groups will go up to a million dollars these days. Uh, early stage VCs, 1.5 to five, we'll say. And later stage VCs, $10 million and up. So, so think about that in terms of who you're talking to. I won't talk a lot about debt financing because if you could get debt financing, we wouldn't talk about any of the rest of this. All I will say is that if you do have the kind of revenue and numbers and cash flow that you can get debt financing, again, I want you to live to fight another day. Um, and that means that if something goes wrong, don't sign a personal guarantee. Don't sign a personal guarantee. Don't take the money if you have to sign a personal guarantee. That's my rule. Same with security. If you have to pledge your personal assets, be awfully careful about that, because you know banks are not in the business to you know to for any reason other than to make money and to cover their bad losses and bad debts. Um, so, by the way, why do I say we're not? You're probably not a candidate for debt financing. There's a couple things. If you've got enough cash flow to finance debt, first of all, it's cheaper, like we said. But secondly, that means that you're focused on kind of immediate profitability. And uh, some of the financiers I'm gonna to talk to you about today, like venture capitalists, that's not what they want. They don't want short-term profitability. They want long-term value, long-term gains. You, I rarely, rarely see a startup company client that actually has, uh, has EBITDA or income, current income. Instead, they reinvest all of their earnings and build a huge goodwill asset that 
that our investors can sell at capital gains or maybe even zero rate of tax. So, uh, so if you're the kind of company that's got cash flow, you're probably not a candidate for venture anyway, even if they did want you. Government grants, I'll just let you know that they're out there and uh, you'd be surprised how much is available and what's fundable, if you're, especially if you're in an ESG kind of business, that's like an impact investing business, energy, agriculture, food, health, you might be able to find government grants to support what you're doing. So that's a lot of work, I'll warn you, to apply for a grant, but it is worth looking into because it is some of that non-dilutive financing uh, that we had talked about. Okay, friends and family, 38% of founders raise money from friends and family. Average amount, this is an old number. I think it's more than that now, but as of maybe five or six years ago, $23,000 was the average amount invested by friends and family per startup. The uh, caution here where people get in trouble with this is by taking money from unsophisticated investors who don't understand the risk. And not only that, but they're also probably what we call non-accredited. And accredited, you can think generally of as a rich person. Um, it's um, to be accredited, a person has to have either a million dollars in net worth, not including their personal residence, or they have to have income of $200,000 a year, 300,000 jointly for the current year and the prior two years. Uh, if you take money from a non-accredited person, you can do that. You can have up to 35 unaccredited investors on your cap table if you're here in California, but it's gonna make things more difficult for you down the road when you start trying to raise money from institutions. And then outside money, angels, VCs, crowdfunding, private equity, et cetera. So the first question is, geez, how much should we raise from anybody? And so here's the first thing that we can do. Number one, figure out how much money it's gonna to take to get to the next milestone, right? And I like to do it this way. And by milestone, I mean, what's gonna get you to the next valuation event? And you'd like that valuation event to double your value. How much will it take to get to that event? And maybe it's an FDA approval. Maybe it's a product launch. Uh, maybe, um, who knows, it's, it's, it's a patent issuance, whatever it is. How much will it take to get you to that event? Take enough to get you to that event. And we want that, that valuation event to be a big one, like one and a half to two times. And typically that'll last one to two years. Now, that's what I mean by stage finance. Is you're taking just enough money to get there. Now, I put in a line here about up versus down rounds. And again, this is why you got to be careful about valuation. You want to get this right. Because if somebody comes in and they pay you too much for your company, you might think, how is that possible? They paid me too much. Well, that means when you get to your next valuation event, you're not an up round at all. You're a down round. In other words, your valuation is less than the last round. That's a down round. It's a really bad thing for a company to do a down round. It sends a very bad message to the market. So you want to avoid that if possible. And I've been worked with clients and we've just bent over backwards doing machinations to avoid having to say we have a down round. So just keep that in mind when you're valuing the company and thinking about staging your finances. Let's talk about angels. Does anyone know what that is, by the way? I'm from North Dakota, so you know we used to see do this every winter. It's a snow angel, in case you were wondering. So angels, uh, angels are wealthy individuals who make one-off investments in portfolio companies. Angel groups are groups of these individuals, like Band of Angels, um, Sand Hill Angels, uh, Harvard Angels. There's, there's millions of them, really. Maybe not millions, but there's lots of them. It's just groups of individuals. They'll go ahead and you'll pitch to the group at one time. And then a group will get together and just make a pooled investment um, or, or maybe make individual investments, but you'll get a group of them at a time so you don't have to talk to 12 people. You know, you don't have to talk, pitch 12 times to one person, you pitch once to 12 people kind of thing. Angel funds is exactly what it sounds like. It's one step beyond. We got that group of angels. Now they just pool their money and put it into a fund. So it's one investment by that group instead of 12 investments at the same time. So those were what I mean by angels. Now there's, you know, we could go on and on. There's micro, there's super angels, which are more like VCs, you know, et cetera. 
but that's kind of the general idea. They're gonna be the early money in. You want them to be smart, meaning they understand your business. Uh, you'd like them to have chemistry, meaning you get along with them. You'd like them to be committed to your company and support you down the road. Of course, they have to have the money to do that. And really importantly, they have a network, right? They can introduce you to VCs and institutions down the road to take you to the next level. Let me talk a little bit about angels. Um, I don't know if any of you remember the movie or if anyone's old enough to remember that old Clint Eastwood movie, The Good, The Bad, The Ugly. Uh, I saw it on the big screen when it came out. And uh, I've always liked that, that title, although I didn't quite understand the movie. And angels come in that category too, good, bad, and ugly. You want good angels, right? Good angels are gonna give you that connection to venture capital funding. They're gonna be smart. They're gonna offer mentorship. They're gonna give you good advice. And they understand, they do this enough that they understand that this is risky business. That's who you want in your company. Bad angels, let me tell you what I mean by hostage takers, whiners, and demanders. Hostage takers are gonna always hold you to the fact that you took their money. And because you took their money, you have to do this. And because you took my money, you have to do that. You know, I want more frequent reports. I want you to call me every other day, you know, on and on. They'll always remind you, you took my money, you owe me obligations. That's not really a good angel. Uh, whiners, this is exactly what it sounds like. They're always gonna be complaining about something, about what you did or did not do. And demanders, um, it's exactly what it sounds like. You know, we hereby demand this, we demand that. I want my reports, I want my information. I want you to open this to me and tell me about this. I want a meeting. You know, you don't wanna have that level of distraction. And, you know, so when you're picking your angels, try to avoid the bad. Definitely avoid the ugly. And the ugly I'll call potential plaintiffs for number one, meaning these are people who cause a lot of problems um, and get so upset and aren't afraid to go litigate if they don't like the way things are going. And the second kind, or I'll just call them disturbers. Um, they're just going to create problems. Let me give you an example of what I mean. I've seen companies where the angels went and discouraged the VCs from investing in the company because they didn't like the valuation um, and they thought it would dilute them too much. Um, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about safes and notes but they thought the valuation was too high and therefore they would end up with too small because, they're, because they had notes that converted in the valuation um, instead of equity currently, they would get diluted by a too high valuation. So they're acting at cross purposes to the company. We can talk more about that in a second. The potential plaintiffs are exactly what it sounds like, very litigious people. And whenever you talk with anyone you do business with, I do this, uh, I go online and I see if they've got lawsuits and you can, it's all public, you know, you can find out in the public databases if somebody has been a plaintiff or a defendant. If they've sued companies they've invested in, you want nothing to do with them. You want nothing to do with them. Um, if they've been defendants, you might want to wonder why. In fact, uh, I've turned, I and I won't do business with people that are litigious. It's an odd thing for a lawyer to say, but I just, you know, anybody with $2,500 can make your life miserable. So you want to avoid that. In fact, some there's been some parties I wouldn't do business with just because of who their lawyers are, because I know how litigious their lawyers are. And I know it's going to be a bad result. So that's just my personal, you know, kind of tip for you. Now I go back to the, to, I was talking about the disturbers and the convertible notes and the safes. When you do your angel financing, it's likely not going to be what we call a priced round, meaning selling preferred stock at a particular valuation and giving up a certain percentage of the company. It's likely to be one of these convertible instruments, like a convertible note or a safe. Convertible note is a debt instrument that converts to stock down the road at some valuation. A safe is a, stands for simple agreement for future equity. It's not simple, it's not equity, Right, I guess it is an agreement. We got that part done, and it's certainly not safe. Uh, and what it is, it's just you take the money today, and you give them stock in the future. But it's not a note. It doesn't carry interest. It doesn't have a fixed repayment date. It only converts in the stock or gets paid when you sell the company or 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 maybe when you liquidate. 
So that's the difference. Almost always we do notes and saves. Here on the West Coast, it's almost always saves. You hardly ever see convertible notes anymore. The further east you go, the more you see convertible notes because investors like to have that promise of a return, uh, of getting their money back at some point. Keep in mind that has significance because uh, the nature of convertible notes is they have a short fuse. Uh, in other words, that they come due fairly quickly. That means they have to convert fairly quickly, meaning you have to do your next equity round fairly quickly. And if you don't, you're like within a year to two years, you're in default under the note. And technically the note holder can sue, get a judgment, foreclose and take your company away. And I have seen that happen more than once. So it's not just a theoretical possibility. Most investors won't do that, right? Because they want to, they want you to go make the company succeed. They don't want your assets. But I've been in deals where the investor just wanted the assets. Has a conversion feature. It'll automatically convert into stock when you do your financing. It can convert into stock anytime the safe holder wants it to. Um, and it's rarely, if ever, is prepayment allowed. In other words, you can't just say, okay, here's your money back. Now that we got our big financing, you got to give them the stock. Valuation cap. So here's the concept. The um, safe or the note says, here, Mr. Investor, you give me your $100,000 today. I'm going to give you stock, uh, hopefully within a year, when I do my next equity financing, and you're going to get stock at that valuation. So you get in at the venture capitalist professional valuation. We don't know the value now, so we can't convert you now. And that sounds like a good deal until the investor starts thinking, well, wait a minute, you're going to use my money to increase the value of the company. And then when you convert my $100,000, it's going to get just a teeny tiny little bit. When if I got stock today, it'd probably be a much bigger amount. So enter the valuation cap. And the concept is that that $100,000 will convert at no higher than a maximum valuation stated in the document that guarantees the investor a certain percentage. So we see those always now um, in safes and convertible notes. Discount, <clears throat> let's suppose, here's the other thing. Mr. Investor, put your money in today and you get stock later, but since you got in early, we're gonna give you a discount of the preferred stock price. So for every $80 you put in now, you get $100 worth of stock later. That's a discount. We always see that, it's usually 20%. A uh, couple other terms on change of ownership, they'll get paid. In other words, if you sell the company, you, they, you let them convert or they get a multiple, the money they put in. Um, shadow preferred, that's just the concept of, uh, I don't wanna get too deep in the weeds on that, but concept, they get a little different preferred than your investors. Pre and post money, I do wanna pause on because if you're doing safes, you might've gone online and you might've downloaded a very popular form of safe that's freely available online, doesn't cost you anything, becomes highly regarded and it's everybody recommends it, everyone writes about it. I don't wanna say which one it is, I'll just say that that safe that everybody's using is what we call a post money safe, is a terrible idea, a terrible idea. You want a pre-money safe. A post money safe means that valuation cap becomes really important means your investor is getting a certain percentage of the company in the financing, no matter how many other safes you've sold. So if you've sold $100,000 worth or $100 million worth, they get the same percentage post money. Does that make any sense? No, it makes no sense at all. That is what is in the most prevalent safe form. You have your lawyer drafted, have it be a pre-money safe, which means the safe holder gets diluted along with all the other safe holders and options increases as well uh, before you get to that point. MFN is most favored nations. It just means your investor, if they're smart, they'll say, look, I'll give you whatever terms you want in your safe, but if you sell any of these safes at, better, at a better deal than mine, I have to get the same deal as the next one. Convertible note we talked about, short-term, secured sometimes, hardly ever, subordinate. They should be, oh, let me back up. I'll just tell you, we don't do this very much. They carry minimal interest, they have fixed repayment, and we have discount and valuation caps in debt, just like in saves. All right, let me jump ahead a little bit here. I wanna pause on this pre versus post money thing, just for a second, to make sure you all understand, because it is really more significant than people think. Company sells a million dollar safe with a free money valuation cap. That means the safe takes 20%, right? Because 4 million pre, 
take a million dollars, that's 5 million posts, your million is worth 20%. That's what that means. Uh, if that's post money, I thought I had a slide. If we said the safe is post money, 4 million, that means your million is 1 million over four is 25%. That's the basic concept. Um, there is a tool that will help you figure this out, by the way. All right, let's keep moving here. Um, water down preferred stock, <laughs> the Siri seed stock. What it is, is if you actually are going to price the round. In other words, if the investor says, I want to price the round, I want to know what percentage of this company I'm going to get. So uh, I want stock. Well, remember my rule, you don't want to sell common stock. You want to keep that stock price low. So you sell preferred stock. But since they're so early and it's probably not a lot of money, you don't want to spend a fortune negotiating terms. So there's this thing called Series C Preferred, which is usually 1x participating. I'll talk about what that means in a minute here. But it doesn't have all the rights and privileges that uh, venture capitalists would ask for. It doesn't have redemption rights, doesn't have a board seat, doesn't have registration rights, all that stuff they ask for. So we call it Series C stock. That's what you'll do in your first priced round, uh, if you probably, probably. All right, um, let's move on to, to venture capital. And um, because that is sort of what everybody wants and everybody goes for, and that's their measure of success if they've managed to get venture capital. That's a picture of a venture capitalist, by the way, if you were wondering from the Monopoly game. So here's some. Here's some advice about venture capital from a venture capitalist, all right? Uh, Randy Komisar from Straight Talk for Startups. Now, um, why does he say that? We're gonna get into that in a minute, but it goes along with what I was saying. That's, what, that's funding of last resort. If you can take debt, you'll do debt. If you can do non-dilutive financing, you'll do non-dilutive financing. If you can do almost anything else, you'll do it. But if you can't, you'll do venture capital. It is high risk, but it is high return. So these days, there's a lot of venture capital in the market. It's very frothy. Uh, our funding here is at a all-time all high, according to, to, to Crunchbase. Um, first half of, uh, of 2021, $288 billion invested. That is huge. That's incredible. That's an incredible number. And you can kind of see it's just been going up and up and up and up. Uh, this one drops off at 2020. This is number of deals and amount invested. Um, the rounds are getting larger, so the number of deals has gone down a little, but the amount invested just keeps going up. Just keep going up. We're at historical records. And even in this year, 2021, last year was a record year at 130 billion. This year is going to be even bigger than last year. We can already see that because the first quarter we were halfway to last year's record uh, at 62 billion. So um, let me jump ahead a little. These all slides all say the same thing. It's big and late stage, it's big and early stage. There's a tremendous amount of money in the market. So how do we make you an attractive candidate for venture capital? Well, like I say, first of all, you're going to have to be at that point where uh, the traditional wisdom is you need proof of concept for an angel, you gotta prove them it works, okay? You need traction. Um, I'm sorry, proof of concept for friends and family, traction for the angels. Most angels, they want to see that you can actually sell this stuff, that people will pay you for it. That's usually what traction means, that you can get users, paid users. But you want to see um, scale for venture capitalists. That's kind of the, the traditional wisdom. They want to know that you've got product market fit, or some buzzwords you'll hear, that people in the market will actually pay for this, and you can scale it. You can build it into something much, much bigger than it is now if you take their money. The other thing I want to pause on is that it, ESG investing has gotten to be so important these days. It's just the latest buzzword and everybody is rushing to say, hey, we are an ESG investor. And ESG is environmental, social, and governance. And we used to call it, we sometimes call it impact investing or sustainable investing or stuff like that. But the idea is it's investing that um, somehow it has a noble corporate purpose. Like um, you can see the negative screens, like um, our fund will never invest in anything that has anything to do with gambling, you know, or weapons. But mostly it has more to do with things like environment, like 
you know, we're going to invest in things that are going to save the planet, uh, or maybe even things that that uh, promote social justice. It could be anything, but there's a long lot of reasons. I won't go into now. I'll just tell you it's gotten important to vet VCs, and I'm seeing it on their due diligence list now. It's always we want to see your your anti-corruption policies. We want to see your ESG policies. We want to see your KYC. You know, we want to invest in companies that are that have impact because it's going to make it a lot easier for that company to get sold to a public company that's really concerned about this. So a little point pointer to keep in mind. Okay. Um, strategic venture capital is a little different. Um, it has more to do, and by that I'm thinking more about corporate venture capital. Uh, so there's financial investors and strategic investors. Venture capitalists are typically financial. They invest for the return. Sometimes you find corporations will form their own venture capital funds that they call strategic. They invest for some strategic business reason. So if you're going to take strategic venture capital, it's a mixed bag. Um, on the plus side, um, they won't want to control your company near as much as a VC. They'll give you a lot more latitude to operate, so you won't end up negotiating all those terms. On the negative side, I've heard that it's sometimes hard to get their attention, right? Because it's, a, and, and I've seen that. I've had clients take strategic venture and the person you dealt with, they leave and there's nobody that takes their place uh, or your champion leaves and they stop funding you or a million other things like that happens. You have to deal with politics. And that usually means they're not gonna be as involved as you might want them to be. And you can't get them to sign anything when you need them to because they're on your board. More importantly, most of them will want to write a first refusal, write a first look, or write a first offer. What that means is that if you sell your company, you have to give the strategic venture capitalist the opportunity uh, to bid on it and make an offer or at least know about it so they can be in the fray to buy you. So keep that in mind. Um, also keep in mind, what are your customers going to think about it? Uh, do you have confidentiality concerns? What if they find out how you do this? All of that stuff. Okay, venture debt, I'll just mention that there is such a thing. It's expensive. Uh, you gotta pay fees and give warrant coverage. A warrant is a right to buy additional stock at a certain fixed price down the road, but it's out there. It's a way for a company that is high risk and high return to borrow money that will convert into stock in the next round. It's usually secured by the intellectual property. So if you've got a really good, you know, powerful IP asset, it might be a good option. And venture debt will probably result in less dilution than if you than traditional venture capital. All right, to go out to investors like that or any investors, angels, VCs, um, venture, et cetera, you want an executive summary. Here's an example. If you email me, I can send you a soft copy of this. It's one page, just the facts, ma'am. Uh, team projections, market industry, and your IP. That's it. You know, you just want to let them know at a glance if they want to buy into your company. And of course, I'm not going to talk about pitch decks. I'll just tell you, that you eventually you're going to have to have a good pitch deck and there's a million resources for showing you how to put together a good pitch deck. My advice to you is don't put valuation in any of your documents, right? Don't put it in your executive summary. Don't put it in your pitch deck. The investor is going to tell you what you're worth. If you put a valuation and they're just going to cut it in half and that'll be their starting offer. And then finally, Really, I don't care how good you are, get a professional designer. I mean, I've sat in uh, meetings with top tier VCs. God, I was in one two weeks ago with Andreessen. They don't get much bigger than them. And at the end of the pitch, all the guy said was, you really need to get a professional designer. That's not good. That's not good when they're so focused on the design of your deck, they don't even, you know, they, it, it distracts them from your, how you're gonna change the world. So I always say, get a professional designer. I don't want to talk too much about pitches. I want to jump ahead, given we only got a few minutes, into some of the. Well, I will say this: um, um, if you ever do have an investor that says to you, that doesn't say, "Here's what I think you're worth. Here's a term sheet. Um, what do you think you're worth?" Um, I've got a way for you to give them a number, okay? And if you email me, I'll send you my memo on this. But basically, I've identified about 30 different valuation methods. Here's a few of them. Here's a few more that I've seen VCs use or heard about them using to value companies. 
So what you do is you just put three of those together on a spreadsheet that converge on a number, and you can say, here's my number. It doesn't happen very often, but sometimes. Rewards-based crowdfunding, so where you go on Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and you just keep in mind, this is all public. And when people do this, they do this strategically. First of all, it's a marketing effort. They want to show the world people love their product. Um, and secondly, they want to do this in a way that they know it's going to succeed. Because if it doesn't succeed, everyone in the world is going to know. If you have a failed crowdfunding, it's not going to play well with your next investors. VCs have mixed feelings about crowdfunding. All right, Reg CF equity crowdfunding. I want to mention this. Uh, currently, under current law, a company can sell up to $5 million now. It used to be $1 million. It's $5 million of securities in any 12-month period. You can do this to anybody, unaccredited, widows and orphans. You do it on a crowdfunding platform. Um, but the amount they can invest is very small. Those are three of the big platforms. There's others that are very reputable. This is a really good way to raise money these days. I used to be very opposed to this. I'm not any longer. Crowdfunding has really come along for a lot of reasons. Accredited only equity crowdfunding. This is where you go onto a platform like AngelList or something like that. There's lots of them and you sell, but only to accredited, accredited investors. This is another really good way to raise money. A plus is when you're a little later stage, you can raise up to $50 million with an A plus round with not too much pain. Uh, we won't talk much about that, just know that it's there. I'm just gonna mention two more. Um, one is ICOs, uh, they're just, they're, it's over. You know, they're just done. We're just not seeing ICOs in the United States. Um, we are seeing them in foreign countries and we are seeing token offerings that are not public offerings. They go out on platforms like T0 and they go to a small group of accredited investors I'm a big believer in that model, by the way. It's a way to raise, it's like revenue, it's like non-deluter funding. So it's out there. Uh, you have to do a lot of homework before you can do that. <clears throat> the last one I wanna talk about is royalty financing, um, also called SEALs, Shared Equity Appreciation Loans. And it's an alternative to, to both loans and equity financings. Basically, you're selling uh, an income stream or a revenue stream to an investor. So you say, you give me X dollars now, and I will give you um, a share of my revenue from this product line for the next however period of time. Uh, VCs will see that as debt, just so you know. So it ranks ahead of them as debt in the stack, in the preference stack. But it is a way to raise money that is getting more and more popular all the time. Now, I've got a lot of slides left, but I want to leave time for Q&A because the rest of these slides are going to go into more detail. So I'm going to stop my share and open things up uh, to Q&A. And I think uh, the Q&A is in the chat. Is that right? Correct. All right. Okay, what's the difference between angels and angel groups? I, You know, I think I covered that. Um, the angels, not much. I mean, it's whether you're talking to an individual, an individual cowboy, or whether you got a whole group of uh, individuals in a room that are going to, um, you're going to pitch to at one time. Um, we'll talk more about angels if we get time. Okay, does crowdfunding impact angel and VC financing? You know, that again, that depends who you talk to. Um, I know uh, I've been on a panel with uh, Bill Reichert from, um, um, Pegasus and also Garage Ventures, and he hates it. You know, he he said, "Don't take it. Don't take crowdfunding." You know, I don't like it. Um, and I uh, and um, and keep in mind, there's two kinds of crowdfunding. There's the rewards based, where you don't give up equity. And there's crowdfunding where you do give up equity. And I um, I used to counsel companies against doing the uh, equity crowdfunding because. Uh, it just puts a hundred new um, unsophisticated, unaccredited investors onto your cap table. And my point was, what investor is going to want to get involved in that mess? Uh, so I counseled several companies not to do it. And I heard several VCs say, yeah, we don't want to deal with that problem. And plus, unaccredited, unsophisticated investors, I mean, that's just another word for potential plaintiffs. 
Um, but several of those companies have gone on and gotten venture capital financing anyway. So, you know, I stand corrected. You know, it is possible to do pretty well uh, and to get that start, get that pre-Series A money through a crowdfunding. So I'm telling companies now, yeah, you can do it. Now the law just changed. It used to be not worth the hassle because it was only a million dollars. You couldn't test the waters. I'll talk more about that. And you couldn't aggregate the investments you know, into a special purpose vehicle. The law's changed. Um, now it's $5 million. So it is worth the trouble because it's relatively expensive. You got to have a business plan. You got to have file a report with the SEC. You have to have audit or financial statements. You got to pay a broker or a portal. It's a hassle. It's a big hassle. But for $5 million, it's worth it, probably. <clears throat> now the law, so it's not only $5 million, but you can use an SPV. So you can put all of your investors in one vehicle that makes one investment in the company. We used to do custodial arrangements that did the same thing before. So you don't have a million different people voting. You got one person voting all their shares. That makes it a lot easier. And we got testing the waters, which means that you can go out on Facebook and ask all of your friends if they would invest in your company if you let them. And that's not a public solicitation. You're allowed to do that uh, before you couldn't. So you know before you even do this whether you're going to have some interest in it. So um, I think it impacts angel and VC funding a whole lot less than it used to. And I also think that it's sort of a substitute. Um, we, and no one wants to hear that, but it kind of is. $5 million, yeah, it's a substitute. It competes with them. That's why I say there's so much money in the market. You know, I don't see any other questions here in the chat, so I might just return to the screen unless there are other questions. Any other questions? If you have questions, put them in the chat. In the meantime, I'm going to go back to my screen and kind of drill down on a couple of these other points. Um, you should be seeing a screen now that says royalty financing. Uh, I'm going to move on now and talk about should you take venture capital? So let's talk a little bit more about venture. And then I want to talk about SPACs. Actually, I'm going to talk about SPACs first. And we'll come back to venture capital. Because um, I know um, a lot of you are thinking about it. You've been reading about it. You've been hearing about it. And I've got my own spin on it. Oh, I've got it. SPACs. SPACs are special purpose acquisition companies. They're publicly traded. Um, it's a blind pool of capital. Money goes into this blind pool and it's being used to acquire a single business, maybe yours. Uh, the investors in the SPAC, they purchase a unit, which is usually common stock and a warrant. A warrant is a right to buy additional stock and they hold it up in, in trust in this SPAC, this special purpose vehicle, uh, usually a corporation or an LLC. And then they find a company to buy and then they buy the company basically. Uh, and then the investors have the right to back out if they don't like the company. So the business combination, it's called the DSPAC transaction. That's where they actually acquire something. Here's what it looks like. If you think in pictures, um, we have sponsors, they create the SPAC. They get shares in the SPAC for just creating it. The SPAC goes out and sells money in the public market to the public investors. Takes that money and uh, then they hire an investment bank. They pay them a humongous fee. And um, the investment banker finds them a private company to buy. They buy that company, they take their ownership share, they put the money into the private company. Now in this SPAC, they're only taking 25%, but they could take 100. You could totally exit in the DSPAC transaction. And that's what that purchase to the private company is, that's the DSPAC. How popular? Well, um, average IPO size in 2021, um, was $311 million gross proceeds in millions, one of, whoops, sorry, seven. I guess what I'm trying to show here is that uh, we've gone from 59 SPACs to 345. Um, and, oh, you know, I don't have a column here for um, SPAC size, but they're, they're small, you know, they're, they're comparable to IPOs. But the important thing here is just look how popular they are. 345 of them done in 2021. Now, let me give you a better metric. Here's what the growth looks like of SPACs over the last few years. Now, there was an article in the Business Journal today um, uh, that basically said, 
you know, if Theranos had been around today, they would totally get acquired by a SPAC. They'd be a perfect SPAC candidate. <laughs> so that tells you a little bit about what the market is viewed like, okay? It is viewed as not doing as much diligence as it probably should. Um, let me just kind of conclude this part, uh, and then we'll drill down maybe on some VC terms. I just want you to know that, you know, if, if your company is not doing a happy event, um, you know what, the whole point of doing the financing is so you can do an exit. You'd like that to be a sale or acquisition or an IPO, and you'd like it to be at a good number. And that's great. We can do an hour on that at some point. Um, if it's not, um, there are a lot of things to think about. And this is what I call unsuccessful exits. That's where the investor or the invest in the company goes nowhere, but it won't die and it won't sell. It's a zombie company. The shareholder litigation is a good example of everybody, including the investors being sued by some of the common stockholders because of the way the company was sold because it paid back the investors and some insiders and then not the common. So we have to think a lot about fiduciary duties uh, in this case. And I'm saying this now when you talk about investors because different investors are gonna hold you to different standards. And the more sophisticated the investor, the lower the standard because they can take care of themselves. The less sophisticated ones, they're gonna be the ones that are going to say, oh, well, gee, you didn't tell me that. If I'd known that, I never would have given you my money. How could I be expected to know that? So if you think you might have an unsuccessful exit, that's going to come up. And then I've got a whole bunch of other issues. I, again, I always want you to be able to live to fight another day. So I always say, you know, don't take personal liability. And you can do it by not paying company taxes. Uh, you can do it by not paying employees now. In fact, there's a bill in California to criminalize wage theft, which is not pay, paying employees. So, and it really goes after gig economy companies saying that, look, you misclassified them. Not only did you misclassify them, you didn't pay them their wages that they're entitled to under law, meal breaks, rest breaks. And that's under, there's a bill introduced that would make that a crime. It's not a chance it'll pass, but it's been introduced. Securities fraud, fraud claims. Um, but again, I want you, if this doesn't work out, to be able to go out and take your next idea. And I'll just tell you one story. I have a client who came to me you know, 10 or 12 years ago. And this, he's from a foreign country and he had developed 40 different apps. 39 of them failed. <laughs> one of them are, um, one of them was wildly successful. I can't tell you which one, but it was wildly successful. That company is a unicorn today. Right, you know what a unicorn is? It's worth more than a billion dollars. Now, if he had not planned this well, the 40th company would have just paid for the 39 prior mistakes and never would have got off the ground. It never would have got investors. It never would have uh, been successful. It never would have been a unicorn. Um, and they took money from the top tier venture capitalists on, on Sand Hill Road and went on to be a very, very successful company. It's one of the most downloaded apps in the app store. So, you know, just be careful about planning into this stuff. I'll circulate the slides, but I want you to know that there is some reading here that you might think about. This is my essential reading list. If you want to find out more about financing, this is kind of venture capital centric uh, and startup centric, but I think it's all really, really good advice. Okay, we've got about three or four minutes left. So let me go back to some of the provisions that um, you'll find in term sheets. And uh, number one, let's talk about diligence for a minute. You know, I said early on in the hour that you wanna make sure you clean up all your problems before you get to the investor. You don't want them telling you about it. So number one would be intellectual property rights. Make sure you own your IP. Um, patents are good. You should patent early and often. Some people disagree with me on that, but I think that's good advice. Um, make sure you've got all your invention assignments in place, that your data is secure. Um, that's going to be very important to an investor or acquirer. Number two, um, and this is employment claims. This is a big one because a misclassification, meaning if you classified someone as a contractor or an employee under local law, that could bring the company down. 
because misclassified employees have tremendous rights and state agencies have tremendous rights to enforce their rights, whether they want to or not. And they regularly do. And I regularly see companies tanked because of this one. Probably this is the number one thing. Google a company called Homejoy. If you want to see how bad it can get, that's a company that took $40 million of venture capital and then failed because of an mis employment misclassification lawsuit. Tax claims, um, make sure that's clean. It's going to pop up in the public record and it doesn't look good. Uh, you want to make sure you're in regulatory compliance, litigation, you know, do a search. You might not know who sued you, as odd as that sounds. You know, you don't have to know. Anyone can file anything and not tell you. Claims by prior employer, just make sure that your IP is clean, right? It belongs to you, you developed it. You didn't develop it on your old employer's dime. And then uh, the rest of this is just really good governance. All righty, let's see if we have any more questions in our chat here. Next strategy, and we talked, we, our exit strategy is something VCs want to hear about. Yeah, that's a really good question. This might answer the um, question. Oh, sorry, According to Wikipedia, Alexa now wants to answer that question. So yeah, exit strategies are something VCs mm -hmm. want to hear about. They want to know what your strategy is, what your plan is. They want to know, um, um, uh, in particular, how you think you're going to make them money and what your time frame is. Now, you don't have to be right. You don't have to be perfect. This is all puffing. These are all forward-looking statements, much unlike what you know, Liz Holmes is being accused of having said uh, our statements of fact. These are statements about the future of what you think might happen. So you've got a lot of leeway, but you got to be able to back it up. And if you think that you're, and by the way, this is really important because if you think your potential acquirer is Google, well, you might want to draft your patent claims in the way that Google might want to see them, right? So it does make a difference as to who your potential acquirers are. And we have that conversation often in a company. You know, we're going to build it up and we're going to market it to these companies. So you want to look really good to those companies, do the kind of deals they want to do. Secondly, you want terms in your documents that accommodate the kind of deals that those companies do. So if you work with a company that often does earnouts, um, you might want to have that built into your organizational documents. Um, the times one should allocate to each method of financing. Well, you should stage it. So first you're gonna, you know, once you, friends and family, first it's angels really, it's the first outside money, we'll call it. And um, again, you wanna stage it, you wanna take enough to get you to the, to where, what it'll take to make you attractive to an institution. And if that takes two years, that's what it takes. Um, hopefully it won't take longer than that. The kind of companies I work with, they tend to grow really, really quickly. So two years is a lifetime. Uh, they better get to a VC by then or they're not going to go anywhere. Um, so I think that, I think I know what you mean, if that's what you mean. All right, we're at the top of the hour. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here. Again, you've got my information in the chat. Shoot me an email if you would like uh, the slides or a copy of my book or any other information that I can provide to you. Um, I would encourage you to go to my YouTube channel and subscribe because we have lots of content like this and it comes out every other week. All right, I have to give you back the host.